I find that we have such tactical patience and our guys know what to do and when to do it. And they're so fluent in that language that nine times out of 10, it's like, oh, it's another night. They felt bad for like our adversaries or enemies because they wouldn't know what hit them. You could see them like getting their kid on, thinking they're about to get in the fight. They don't know they're already dead. We had to beat on them before they even decided. We were just waiting for them to make the decision. Let's talk about the first time you were in a leadership role where yeah. you were involved in, in in an engagement. Yeah. So fast forward, next deployment out there. We, we did a couple of their meeting deployments along the way. It was a long, it was a hard season of life. In about a three-year period, I was home less than nine months at any given time. Uh, it was just a, we were, we were moving. Uh, we were always deployed or always on a training trip, always gone. Um, so I'm in my leadership role now. We're downrange again. And yeah, I'm not sure. It was, uh, it was kind of anticlimactic, actually, the first few for me. I remember thinking like, oh, that's it. We rolled in. We uh, were very good at what we do. And we controlled the target, never, never lost control. And I was, it was fun for me to watch these guys work and realize like, oh, this is what this looks like when guys have autonomy, when guys are moving and responding to the enemy. Like I said earlier, you can do all the right things in the world, the enemy gets a vote. But when your guys have autonomy and trust to maneuver to contact as fast as possible, you're responding before the enemy can keep, keep up. And so I saw us all just move as this collective element, the flow. And it was one of those things like Target was secure, everything was done, and I'm looking around like, I guess that was it. Like, this is not at all like what the movies make it out to be. Man, I never thought of that. So you, you're getting like the bird's eye view mm -hmm. of everything all at once. It was fascinating. And, and now there's always ops that don't go as planned and, and it ends up being on your heels a little bit, but most of them... I find that we have such tactical patience uh, and our guys know what to do and when to do it. And they're so fluent in that language that, that nine times out of 10, it's like, oh, it's another night. Like, great. I mean, half the time you almost, you, I, I felt bad for like our, our adversaries or enemies because they wouldn't know what hit them. And some of them would, you could see them like getting their kid on, thinking they're about to get in the fight. They don't know they're already dead. We had to beat on them before they even decided. We were just waiting for them to make the decision. Bad choice. That's hostile intent. They had no idea. I would imagine there's a a certain degree of pride in seeing oh, yeah. your troop. It's great. Operate at that level. It's great. It's it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. I mean, it's it's probably like being on any high performing like professional sports team where Everybody just knows their job. They're they're reading each other. They're communicating without even speaking, and it just flows. And everyone's doing all the right things every single time. It's it's really fun to be a part of. Very humbling. I'll bet. I'll bet it is. Was there ever a point in time where you were you were the troop commander, and you lost one of your guys? No. No, I was. I was on an op where we lost some rangers, uh, but I wasn't the troop commander on that operation. I I was uh, the troop commander when one of my guys got shot, um, so we had to call in a medevac for that. Uh, but but no, I, I never lost uh, a man in combat. Had you ever thought about what you would do if you had? Sure, sure. Uh, you do what needs to be done. You respond. Uh, it, it's. Uh, the, the few times I've been overwhelmed on targets or we had things go wrong where you didn't anticipate it, emotion doesn't really catch up till later is what I noticed. I mean, you, you're in such work mode. We have an incredible way of compartmentalizing emotions and not letting yourself get wrapped into the moment. Um, even, even when Extortion 1-7 happened, there were moments where I felt incredibly calloused and uh, and cold and couldn't figure out what was going on. I even brought in a psych at one point, like, hey, man, was there something wrong with me? Like, I'm very, uh, I'm having a hard time. There were moments where grief would just be overwhelming, but then other times where I couldn't even cry if I wanted to, and I thought there was something wrong with me. And he said, no, no, you guys do this really well. You compartmentalize. That's what happens from day one of BUDS. You learn to compartmentalize emotion, pain, suffering, and, and get the job done. That's what you do. You're on target, you get the job done. 
You let the emotion catch up later. Does he talk about where that goes? He didn't at the time. Uh, and I'm not sure there's one answer. You're talking about where the emotion goes? Yeah, where does it, I mean, when we compartmentalize. Yeah. Because I think, I think I would say the majority of special ops is, is very good at compartmentalization. Yes. And so, but I've never had this conversation and mm -hmm. I wonder at myself, I yeah. don't know why I've never had this conversation, but it'd be where does, we tuck it away mm -hmm. and sometimes, I mean, it comes back in other ways, but where does it go? I think it needs a release. We like to pretend like what the big joke is, right? You take that, you bottle it up deep down inside and you never let it out. It, it, it's impossible. It comes out. Uh, it has to. To your point, it comes out manifested in different emotions. I think with men, primarily anger. I know for me, anger turned to rage. Uh, it has to go somewhere. And, and, and so for me, it, it came out as rage and turned me into an unhealthy person at some point. Um, a lot of guys will then cope with that rage by what, drinking more, medicating more, pain meds, whatever, uh, whatever you need to do, or some other addiction, right? Uh, adrenaline junkies, like there's something that numbs that anger. It's the, I think it's grief turned to anger and then we numb it and as best we can uh, until we finally deal with it. Hopefully we deal with it. Is there anything that you regret as a leader mm -hmm. up to this point? I like to say I have a lot of regret. I have no guilt. There's always things I would do differently and do better, especially in our job field, right? We, and as leaders, we are, we are paid to make quick decisions sometimes with imperfect information available to us. And whenever you armchair quarterback those decisions with a much clearer picture from the future, there's always going to be regrets. I wish I had done this differently. I wish I had thought through that. I wish I had perceived this, but we didn't. And that's the job. We manage risk as best we can with the information that we have available to us. And we do it as wisely as we possibly can in those moments, understanding that decisions have to be made. So we make them and then you live with the consequences. And that's the burden, I think, of leadership, especially in our job field, is living with the consequences of imperfect decisions made in imperfect environments by imperfect people that are going to make mistakes. It's going to happen. That's a burden to bear. That's a tough one. No matter where you're watching Sean Ryan show from, if you get anything out of this, please like, comment, subscribe, and most importantly, share this everywhere you possibly can. And if you're feeling extra generous, please leave us a review on Apple and Spotify podcasts.